to go. Thank you, Rob and Elaine, for being so patient. And um, back again, we're um, tell us where you are right now um, in Maryland, so you can get because I know we're going to speak about that area a little bit as we get into the conversation. Well, we chose to do the interview from Old Ellicott City. Uh, historically, it's a spot that floods whenever there are big northeast storms or hurricanes that come close by. Uh, the train bridge that goes over Main Street down here in Ellicott has uh, the historic uh, floods, uh, 1972, 14.5 feet. Uh, was it 1932 and 1975? It was nine feet, and it just completely flooded out all of the stores here in Old Ellicott City. Um, I don't think they updated it. Wait, there's another one up top. It was 21.5 in 1868. So I also posted a picture on Twitter where a retaining wall, just a block up the street, fell on a whole bunch of cars. So this is an example of, you know, uh, it was just devastating and shocking for both Elaine and I. Um, and... And so one of the things you wanted to speak about was just, um, in general, the the hundred year cycle of these, you know, for lack of a better word, we'll say um, the superstorms and the climate change in relation to the we're having three three consecutive years, one back after another. And I think you said there in Old Ellicott that it actually has come over to seawall damaged that and uh, why don't you work your way up the coast for us and then take us into your your uh, excursion into the uh, Jersey Shore and then let's talk a little bit about what you saw there and your reflections and I would love to hear some anecdotes um, about the people you interviewed because I watched a lot of them but I know there were a lot more well I as far as uh, three consecutive year and hundred year storms Elaine had read something on the trip up there. Would you like to talk about that? The standardized, what was it? Oh, right, right. Um, yeah, so there was a conference in Monmouth about rebuilding New Jersey on Friday. I wasn't there, but somebody I know was there, and she was um, Google docking notes while the conference was going on. And there was a guy speaking from the U.S. Geological Survey, and he said the way we used, we used to do things figure out what's going to happen the next year as you look at the years before. Um, they said that based on how, basically, how different the last few years have been, we just can't do that anymore. What was the term? Remember what the term was? Standardization. No, it's another term. Uh, there was another term. There's a specific term they use in the geological world. Um, so basically, basically, it's that things are not as they've always been. They're different. Uh, and it was, um, Rob and I were kind of shocked because it was somebody from the government saying, this is it, things are different. Was maybe refreshing? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I had listened on C-SPAN uh, a week ago. Uh, I don't know if it's Representative Gillibrand from Long Island mm -hmm. and many different politicians talking to the same effect that there, the debate for climate change is over. Uh, with Hurricane Sandy and the two previous years, uh, they've finally reached a point where enough is enough. The disappointing thing was, I, I listened to the entire show, and the chairperson of that committee, it was a Senate Environmental Committee, uh, actually, no, it might have been a joint Senate House, but uh, James Inhofe was supposed to be there. He's chair of that committee, and he did not show up. And it, that was... Uh, he just did so, not show up. I mean, since then, he's re reiterated that he doesn't believe climate change. So, 
so he didn't show up as just a, a refusal to acknowledge the obvious? Yes. And so how do you think we're supposed to, I mean, wh how do we even respond to that? I, I think I, I was going to get to this later on in the interview, but I, I think we need to uh, we, work, we need to work with a lot of the established uh, environmental groups, uh, Rainforest National Network, uh, Sierra Club. Uh, my cousin is executive director of Sierra Club. I don't exactly agree with them working with. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg of New York City, but he has been working, he gave something like $20 million towards the efforts to end coal. You know, I, I know that might upset quite a few people, the Occupy movement, but, you know, I, I think these established groups, uh, 350.org uh, with Bill McKibben, they're doing a lot with uh, university professors and students. Mm -hmm. They just concluded a tour. I, I went and went to report on the Washington, D.C., 350.org, do the math, and it was incredible. It was... It, was, it, it really, really uh, gave a convincing presentation that it's conclusive. It's that climate change is it's really here. Um, do you but, want to add it? So I know what, the, what I was going to say. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take all that footage that we shot, pictures that we have, and other good pictures if I can find them, and I'm going to put it on a five, seven-minute DVD, and I'm going to take it to him off the office and hand it to somebody. So that's what I'm going to do. Oh, that's that's great because one of the things we've been talking about in general is how to more effectively practice outreach and face to face and putting something in somebody's hand makes it fairly you know you can't argue when it's right there in your hand you you know so that's a great idea. Right, and that was the purpose of going to the Jersey Shore. Um, I grew up in Chattel Beach, New Jersey, which is smack dab and on the barrier island between Point Pleasant and Seaside. And between family members, uh, friends that I've spoken with on the phone, people I keep in touch with and social media from that area, every single person has described the barrier island out there as looking like a war zone. And going there, it was it, it was very shocking. It, it's somewhat traumatizing because seeing these people not only at the beach area on the Barrier Island, but on the mainland near the Bayfront, you, you really you saw it in their faces. You, you had seen the body language of people who were experiencing the effects of a war zone. And so it's not just the physical condition of the area, it's you've really felt it and when you speak with these people you feel it. And it was that, that one interview we did, the one guy was spoke, spoke to the most yeah, but David. In, his, in his face, the whole time in his face where you could just see like shell shock, right? Like I'm talking about this and I know it's real but it doesn't it's not real. Right. Well, you, you know, and there was this sort of just 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 weariness, you like emotional and physical weariness. And uh, while we're talking, I'm going to try to put up some of that footage from your stream without the audio, so people who didn't get a chance to see it can. But but I I felt like my heart went out to him, and he he was I thought he had a spirit of generosity because. When you mentioned, you know, that you felt sorry for him, he was like, well, don't feel sorry for me. Feel sorry for these people. You know, kind of maybe talk about a little bit about that neighborhood that you were in and what the demographic was and uh, just describe the area because, Elaine, you kept, you made the point frequently and it was repeated by the citizens you interviewed that, that people have a misunderstanding 
of what that the South Jersey Shore is like as far as a demographic. Yeah, definitely. And even somebody that I know personally who lives in this area but's originally from Jersey, who knows better, is saying, you know, those are all million-dollar properties. You know, what do they need from us? You know, what Rob and I experienced was totally the opposite. Now, part of the reason it was totally opposite is that there were million-dollar homes there. They were the ones close to the beach, and they're all gone. So the million-dollar homes are actually all gone. And what was left was the third, fourth, fifth homes in on the street. And, you know, what we heard was that they were, you know, full-time residents. He described, uh, David described, you know, a guy, a, a, a family across the street that would wake up every morning and walk their dog and then drive an hour to work because that's where they live. And there was another uh, family, a dad and a son, who lived across the street. I think they, they were retired, but full-time residents. So this misperception that these were, you know, weekend vacation homes or, you know, sort of wealthy people's bungalows, we, we heard something very different, which is these were people's homes, and that things had changed there in the last few years. And I was talking to Rob about this earlier, where the circumstances, you know, you don't want to say things were deliberate, but it feels almost deliberate, which is that the taxes have gone way, way up. And these were, you know, fixed income, retired people. And when the taxes went up, people had to drop their insurance and their flood insurance. So these folks that, you know, David was talking about are people who don't have any insurance to rebuild their home. They're going to need to sell the land that their home was on and take that money and go somewhere else. Right, because they are in a position where they, you know, clearly are not able, well, once they didn't have the insurance, they're clearly not able to repair or rebuild. Because I want to make the point, and you guys can reinforce this, and as we're watching, I don't know if you guys are watching the stream, but we're showing one of the houses being demolished with the big the big backhoe and all that. But this is over a month after after the um you know, after the hurricane. So so what we're seeing here is what exists a month after, not a day after. Right. I, I want Elaine to explain a story as people are watching. Uh a discussion that she had with her mother, uh, a, the depiction of a war zone. Oh, yeah. So um, my son actually went with us to, to the Jersey Shore. And while we were uh, while we were there walking around, my mom called, and he answered the phone, and he was describing what he was seeing. And, and he said it was, well, first she said, it sounds like it's a war zone. And she described that when she was a young girl, she went with her family to live in Germany right after the war, and that every block had a couple of buildings that were bombed out. It was interesting is what my son's response to that, to her was, this isn't like that. This is like the wind took everything away. But anyway, what I said to my mom was, it's sort of like, a war zone in that, you know, somebody's been bombing the buildings, but rather than one or two buildings on every block, it's that there's one building standing on every block. There's, there's hardly anything useful still there. The buildings are destroyed. There are some that are fine. There was one really nice big house that was in really good shape because it was blocked by three other really big houses. Um, but for the most part, that, you know, one house on every block is about what's left there. And we're talking we're talking about from the ocean front to the bay. There are piles of debris pulled from the homes at every single house. Or just almost every single yeah. house. Yeah. And and Rob and I as we were driving away, we were completely overwhelmed after, you know, a few hours of this. And uh, we decided it was time to leave when we were driving away. We had the stream down. We had the cameras put away. And we drove by really the saddest site, which was this old-time arcade that must have had hundreds of the old, old arcade games. Barnacle Bill. Barnacle Bill. And the games were all on the curb waiting to be hauled away because they were destroyed by the salt water. 
Um, yeah, and I actually, you sent me the images, and while we're talking, I'm making a little image set for that because I didn't have time to do it before, but we'll give the people a look at that. And the, um, the footage we're looking at now is um, after the interview when you were out, and it looks like another neighborhood. And I, I, my understanding is that these were densely populated neighborhoods, right? I mean, there were there was a lot of residences there. And when you look at this imagery, it's just a wasteland. Yeah, exactly. As a matter of fact, I uh, I um, I went to Google Maps today and went to the, the regular, the hybrid where you get the satellite and the street the street names and I pulled up the map of where we were and the buildings were jam packed next to each other. It was completely filled with little bungalows. Because the land is so valuable there wasn't much extra space. I was kind of surprised there was a house that had a lawn. Yeah. Yeah, but there wasn't much like that. It was very densely uh, filled. And actually, on the other side of the boardwalk on the map, there were actually some houses on the other side of the boardwalk. And they're just gone. I mean, there's nothing on the other side of the boardwalk now. Um, it, it was, I think I had sort of an intellectual understanding and and I actually have been in hurricane areas before but I had forgotten and when I when I saw what you guys were seeing through your lens I had kind of a visceral or not kind of I had a visceral reaction um and we have some of the chatters on the stream that are from Staten Island Long Island Rockaway areas and they're saying it's the same way there. So this is this is not a localized problem. This is a regional problem. The whole northeast coast. And I was wondering if um in your traveling around talking to the citizens, if you got any sense of, you know, what the 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 federal and state responses were, the aid groups, you know, just just what what is what does tomorrow look like for them? Or do they have any idea? I don't know, Rob. I mean, yeah, can you I, answer it? Because the only thing that I got was from talking to David that they, you know, that they, FEMA had given him $33,000, and that's that. Right. And, I, and he's staying with friends. So FEMA's supposed to be housing you if you displace, but they're not housing the people from that area for some reason. We think maybe the people didn't ask that there was some reason they didn't ask, but they're not getting motel rooms from the government. They're just getting no, they more fair money. No, he wants the same with friends. And the, the two yeah. houses next to him, he said, they don't have anywhere to stay. They don't have anywhere to stay. Right. And they weren't getting FEMA money. Right. There are people who are getting FEMA money. And he, this is something that I struggled with because I'm used to, I, I, I'm used to the Katrina scenario where it was a late response and and I was hoping we wouldn't see that. But when speaking with this this gentleman, David, he was very gracious to FEMA. He was very gracious to the Red Cross. And I was, you know, I wasn't necessarily looking for people who would be mad at FEMA, but there was really, I people who we interviewed were not angry with FEMA. Mm-hmm. They were, they were extremely gracious. They're not getting a lot of help from them as far as financial assistance. But but they seem to comprehend that the situation is so huge that there's no way that any entity could do, you know, a, a, even close to a perfect job, even close to an adequate job. They get that it's too big. Well, and I think, David, um, I was really impressed with, with what he said was he you know he essentially said this was a natural disaster and it's so big how could you expect anybody to be able to respond effectively to it and that he was yeah. grateful for what response was being done but it was he understood the scope and the scale of it right and and Elaine could could explain the uh, trailer situation oh yeah, I can talk a little bit about the trailer situation, although I'm not 
totally sure that the trailers that are shipping are the trailers that were around. But um, so we found out like uh, middle of last week that there were almost 200 FEMA trailers sitting in a parking lot in Pennsylvania. They'd be, been shipped to um, they'd been shipped to Pennsylvania for a storm that happened last year. They were just sitting there, and uh, some. Uh, uh, Smart investigative journalists figured out they were there and started making noise about it. And the decision from the relief people from Occupy Sandy, New Jersey people on their discussion was that they would do two different strategies. Somebody would contact Chris Christie's office because they were told that they could only have the trailers if Chris Christie asked for the trailers. So somebody called Chris Christie's office and was told there were not going to be any trailers. And then another group was going to basically go to other local officials and, you know, make a bunch of noise. So as of, I think, Wednesday, Chris Christie's office had said there would be no trailers. And by Friday, there was an announcement that there would be trailers and that the trailers would arrive in New Jersey by Monday night. The thing we don't know is if they're the Pennsylvania trailers or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, there's more research need to figure out what's going on there, but, um... To the 5 a.m. sky. Yeah, and, you know, we don't know where in in New Jersey the trailers are actually going to end up, but it was this idea that there are almost 200 vacant trailers just sitting there, owned by FEMA, managed by FEMA. They're actually paying monthly storage fees for the trailers to be there and to be maintained. (laughs) Um, But for whatever reason, Chris Christie initially didn't, didn't want them. Uh, there, but but he changed his mind. So there'll be trailers. We'll find out more. Well, you know, and that brings up a whole bunch of questions. Like, why were there 200 unused trailers at another disaster, and why won't they be released here? And you know, it just I don't you know I don't subscribe to conspiracy theories. I do subscribe to god awful management theories and the inability of of some of our organizations that are supposed to be helping us to be able to mobilize. So um, when when I left yesterday, you were still in the area where where Dave was. Did you guys get a chance to make it over to Seaside at all? No. Uh, with our president credentials, we uh, we were allowed to go into Dover Township, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to push it with Seaside. Um, I, I do knew, know people on the police force in Seaside, but, uh, people who I used to play hockey with. Right. When I did school. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know if you mentioned so earlier, but, but you are from that, around that area there. That's your original hometown area, correct? Yeah. When we got there, I, there was such devastation. It was so overwhelming. I really didn't want to push it. You know, it, it was Dover Township Police were kind enough to let us in to report on it. And I, I kind of felt like, first of all, I, I was extremely devastated myself. See, it. and I, after spending a couple hours there, it, it was a little bit too much for me. Well, it had to be incredibly difficult for you, and we we talked before you went up there uh, in preparation, and it's very difficult to return to a place that you knew as one one way and it's been transformed um you know by such a such a storm and all the people so um so, but i i will say that uh, however the police that you guys talked to and how you engaged and interacted with them i thought was pretty positive and they were when, once you told them you were a journalist and you wanted to document it they seemed to be pretty receptive to it they were very nice. I, I spoke with the sergeant in the command trailer, and he was very kind. And and, and it's now the one thing that doesn't come through, and doesn't come through when Ross talking to the police, or or when we're talking about it, because we didn't find out until later that that day, Sunday, was the first day that they were letting anybody down onto those streets that we were on. So the only people who could get there before were the uh, residents and their contractors. Nobody was allowed onto those those last streets before the beach at all until Sunday. 
Right. So, we, you know, if we'd gone there Saturday, we wouldn't be able to get out there. Right. People were, they were guided tours where it was almost like people had to be escorted to, to their homes. Right. So this is the first time that cars were allowed to somewhat roam freely without being pulled over. A lot of people, there, I, I don't know if we want to steer towards the looting conversation yet, but... There has been a lot of looting, mm-hmm. and National Guard and the various police departments had arrested quite a few people for looting. And and so. just I mean we we might as well you know speak to that a little bit. It, it is part of the reality of the situation. And was it was it uh, I don't know maybe you can't answer this, but was it opportunistic mm-hmm. looting or was it you know, survival looting or just, you know... There were thieves. There were, there were thieves. There were people stealing things. And my brother, his contractor out there, had said that a lot of people were caught by both the National Guard and the police. People sifting through. The, the rule out there is you're not even allowed to touch the stuff at the curb. Right. So, not only were people going into the homes, but they were picking stuff that maybe they thought was trash. And but what what your brother said was that for a while, and and maybe still at Seaside, I think that they weren't just checking people when they went in, but they were going through people's trunks when they went out to see what they were what they stocked up on while they were there, and they were arresting people that way. Uh-huh. Um, we didn't encounter that because we were just in a different area, but that, that, I think that was at a different crossroad. Right. Yeah, that was at the Manilow Bridge. Well, you know, it, it's a tragic commentary, but it's a fact of life that, you know, these disasters can bring out the very best in people, which we've seen, and it all goes so can bring out, you know, People who are going to take advantage, it can take, you know, bring out the worst in them. And, you know, we hear stories of price gouging and, you know, the the whole thing about material costs and all that, as if people didn't have um, enough enough issues, um, they're having to deal with those challenges. Um, you got a chance to talk to some of the contractors, correct? Yes, we did. And kind of, how are they? How are they looking? looking at it you know what are they is there any sense of how long the cleanup and recovery will take it's no it's simple answer to that is no it's going to take extremely long time uh the devastation is so thorough uh, that they really don't know the utilities should be on Soon, but they even said that that is tentative. <laughs> but there's nothing to connect to because all the right. buildings are destroyed. Right, and it's and that's that's how they describe it. Is even when they do get the power out there, um, it's going to take a very long time. Now you know you should take a second and explain the difference between where we were, Ortley Beach, and Lavalette, because Lavalette has their power all everything's functional there, and and there's a reason for it. This is a this is a New Jersey puzzle. This this uh, group of towns, right? Right. Uh, the barrier island between Seaside Park and Point Pleasant Beach, there are different boroughs on the mainland that have ownership over different sections of the beach. There are at least five different towns, maybe one or two either way, that have ownership municipality over those separate beaches, and they're spread out throughout, you know, a 15-mile stretch or so. Right, so Tom's River owns, quote-unquote, owns Portly Beach, which is where we were. But then next door, there's a town called Lavalette, and Lavalette is different. Yeah, Lavalette is the only beach area with their own utility. Now, they have managed to get their power back up, they have their traffic lights going. 
Uh, and Elaine and I were talking about this, and I want to bring up the Rockaways. I, I've heard stories about the power not going up in the Rockaways. Uh, the people in the Rockaways might want to get in touch with the borough of Lavalette, New Jersey. <laughs> and secede to, from New York to see and New join York. Lavalette. <laughs> and figure out how to get their own utilities, get their own waterworks, like this tiny little town that is no more than two miles long. Well, and these these towns are adjacent to each other, so you see a distinct difference in township to township or area to area about who's getting services, how well, quickly and, the yeah, recovery's not just going. The, yeah. Let's talk about the gym. Not, not just the services, but what's really interesting is based on um, what the town is, they made different decisions it, it, we're researching a whole other kind of component of this, and I'll mention it in a second, but um, they have different ways they dealt with possible storm preparation. So if you went to Seaside Park, I think is where, they have very old established dunes, and those dunes protect town when there's a storm. And then Lavalette, which we were just talking about, that town made decisions to have jetties, which also dispersed the wave force. Right, so it protected Lavalette from the, the big wave. And where we were in Ortley, hey, well, never. Well, for a second. There's Ortley Beach, there's Silver Beach, there's Ocean Beach, Chadwick Beach, and Normandy Beach. Those are all the Dover Township. And Elaine will talk about that now. Yes. Yeah. So, um,. Somebody I was talking to earlier today told me they used to go to Orly Beach and they had no dunes at all. But apparently in the last couple of years, they put in uh, dunes. And if you listen, David mentioned that, yeah, yeah, they put in some dunes, but they didn't do it right. They just gave the residents patches of dune grass to go plant themselves on, this dune, on these dunes. So the dunes were not very effective. And basically what that caused is that you have got... Areas on either side of Ortley Beach, which are using methods to reduce the force of the waves coming in. But all that power has to go somewhere. So what ended up happening was where other places got 10-foot waves, um, the area in particular where we were in Ortley Beach had a 20-foot wave. Sure. So they really suffered because the town chose to not have a more effective storm protection strategy. And the other thing that we're looking at is there is a program called, do you remember what it's called, the community? There's a flood insurance program that... that community insurance. Something. Community service, something. Um, and basically what it is, there's a list of 18 things that a community can do about flood prevention and flood education. And if they do all those things, then their residents get a, a, a discount, sometimes a really huge discount for their flood insurance. What we're researching right now, we know there are places in New Jersey where the town can just decline to participate in that. We don't know if it's these towns that we visited or around there, but we're going to find out. Because if part of the reason these people dropped their flood insurance was because they didn't get a discount because their town didn't participate, then that's a shame. Right. And so I was going to ask what the obvious question is. If if there's a benefit, you know, to all to doing the things like the jetties instead of the dunes or, you know, whatever, like the, the situation you just described, if it's a common benefit to all, then why did some some townships choose to exercise that, but the other ones didn't. Well, that's Rob's town. That's Tom's River. So why would Tom's River not do what they needed to do and other towns did? I mean, it's, it's really just about money, you know, and deciding where you're going to spend your money. And and Tom's River decided they'd keep their money on the mainland part and, and not on the island. It, it, it's a bureaucracy thing. Uh, the thing is, the thing about Dover Township is 
Dover Township on the mainland is pretty big, and they've always been at odds with the tiny little beach towns who are part of Dover Township over taxes. They, the mainland is the majority of the people, and there aren't many people living. There aren't nearly as many people statistically, statistically living out on those barrier islands. So when the boats come up, Pretty much, the people who live out out on the Barrier Island get screwed because it's a, it's a population and power kind of thing, right? Concentration of power. Right. Yeah, but your question is a good one. Why that doesn't happen? It's well, we do kind of know why that didn't happen um, at Seaside Park and that, that area because they had these different sources of income, right? Right. Right, Seaside brings in a lot of money. And Seaside brings in a lot of money. They had a, a significant number of motels that were being used um, year-round to house low-income people with housing vouchers. Okay, so I want to I want to interrupt you because I I want to yeah. get into that in a, in a little bit, but I want to do it in as a whole, not not an anecdotal kind of thing, because of the Section Eight housing conversation, which just kind of blew me away. And and just I have your image show, uh, Rob, that you sent me, the the images, the still images you showed. And um, what I want you to speak to right now, if you could, is I have this document up where the people can see it. Um, it was the, you know, it's the one that says your structure has possible structure or footing failures. Why don't you talk a little bit about this document, what it means, and the impact it's having on the places that receive them. Um, it's that document. Well, we, we went we, there to research that. We didn't. We, <laughs> we failed. <laughs> we did not find out anything about that because we did not go into D side. Mm -hmm. uh, we asked people about that, and nobody knew about that document. Um, so the document is real. It's just. We didn't make it over to Seaside to research it further. Right. And, it, and and I really want to stress this point. As far as the Hurricane Sandy topic, Elaine and I know very little. We, we've done some research on this, and yes, we did go out there for two hours. And I'm saying this because I grew up out there, and I... If anybody from that area, uh, they, you know, these people are are very proud people, and I want to be very clear that we don't know half of the story. The story that we're telling is it, it, minimal compared to what's really going on up there, and I really wanted to stress that because. There's just so much going on, and as far as that notice goes, things are shifting and changing. My brother, like I said, who is a contractor, he has to check each and every township website every single day because the rules are changing every from day to day. So that notice might not be in effect anymore. We haven't... I've been... Uh, scanning through the newspaper articles online, and I haven't seen anything else about that notice. So we found that like two weeks ago. Yeah, we've had that for a while. And the other thing that we wanted to find out was, because the notice said, if you don't deal with this, we're going to fine you. It would have been really uh, useful to find out, you know, at what point do the authorities say, this person is quitting this property and we're going to demolish it ourselves, and right. clearly there's going to be a line. People have just disappeared. They can't find the people who own these houses that are in pieces. They're going to have to haul them away. Huh. But so we don't know who to ask to get that information. Like, we're a, sure we'll find it. We're pretty good at research. Yeah, it's we'll a good find question. It and the reason I, I wanted to speak to it a little bit was because, um, I mean, you know, and a good point, uh, Rob, that you know, it it could be a non-issue now, and and I really appreciate the fact that 
that you pointed out that that you you don't know i mean even a little bit of the story from the people that are living it day to day and there has to be a lot of uncertainty up there but this document you know was issued to somebody on the 5th of november it says you have to demolish the structure by the 30th of november or you'll be fined two thousand dollars a week per violation which sounds just like a big bureaucratic mismatch but how does anybody cope with that under those situations and and i always think the role of the government should to be prevent this exact thing from happening and yet to see some evidence of it was at least being discussed is you know a little bit disconcerting so. yeah there was a report i think it was in the washington post this week just this last week and it was a, a person describing that they had they had gone back to one of the decent, one of the towns to check out their house just last week. And when they got there, their house was gone. I mean, it was just not there at all. And they went to the some authorities to ask them, you know, well, what, where's my house? And they said, well, we don't know where your house is. You're going to have to ask the Department of Transportation. And they went and they asked the Department of Transportation. It turned out their house was in the middle of the road, and they had to demolish it and haul it away so the people could... It's not funny, but, you know, the people... But this is just last week. So if this person is showing up for the first time last week, um, you know, if there's a demolition order on your house November 5th, but you don't actually show up there till November 30th, or not yet... Um, I think that's where that system breaks down is, do the people even know that those notices are there? They can't find the people. Right. Um, so I, we, we were not able to, to, to track that down, and that was a goal for us going there. So we're going to have to, you know, track down more information about it. But we didn't hear anybody complaining that they were getting fined. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and to the fine thing again, um, I, another story that broke last week is the tow company. Uh, it's AF, AFK towing on Coolidge Ave and Tom's River was contracted by Dover Township and, I guess, Seaside, Berkeley Township, to tow cars before the storm, right, the day before the storm. Mm -hmm. And they wound up going up into people's driveways and taking cars as well. Now, they got caught for gouging. They were charging over $400, upwards of $800 for people to come pick up their cars. Uh, and this, like I said, it was prior to the storm. And people said, well, you were supposed to pick them up in the street. You went into my, onto my property. So it turns out that uh, the company had to return the money tow company had to return the money to people. So that was kind of so the system were, one of the field good stories where... Yeah, well, well, that's that's the system working, so that... Yeah, and we should be grateful for that. Um, and that that is a feel-good ending anyway. Um, so, Elaine, I, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but now let's, let's get back to... to well, we don't want that on the screen. That's just annoying. Excuse me. I clicked the wrong button. And there we go. Um, let's get back to that conversation about, because I was relaying, you know, having watched your stream, the um, the whole conversation about the sex and aid housing near Seaside and um, the, the, you know, editorializing Dave was doing on that, which made perfect sense. So can you speak a little bit about about that and how those, you know, that housing came to be there and the effect the storm that had on the, not only the, the structures but on the people involved? Yeah, well, again, this is something that we didn't know much about beforehand. And then we had a conversation with David. He gave us some information. But then we talked um, to people in Tom's River later about same subject. It turns out that financially it worked out better for those motels to just let people stay there full, you know, all year. They got a guaranteed all year income. 
the, the issue is there's no job there for anybody. And I thought that was kind of interesting, us having this conversation about how that would work, because we're from Maryland, and in Maryland, if you're getting, you know, housing assistance and you're getting, um, quote-unquote, welfare money, you, you have to be in job training or, you know, you have to. Right. And the person that we were talking to said it doesn't work that way in New Jersey. And I thought, well, it's federal money. And they're like, no, 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 they just use New Jersey state money. So it's, we're a little bit unclear what the reality is in New Jersey. But the, the real issue here was there were a whole bunch of people taking up these motel spots and, and, and seaside um, who had no opportunity to work even if they wanted to. There was nothing for them to do. Well, I will. I I want to jump in here. Um, I've lived in those motels with the welfare people back in the eighties, and this situation is it's not new. Um, what tends to happen is uh, a lot of those people work on the boardwalk. <laughs> yeah, but then the rest of the year they they collect welfare and. Uh, so, uh, once again, with a welfare population, uh, when people say, and, it, and it's huge in Seaside, it is enormous. There are a lot of people living in those motels. Uh, when you when you talk about displaced people, then it's comparable to, you know, the poor neighborhoods of Katrina, where this was their lives. So when people say, oh, it's just millionaire homes. No, there there were hundreds of people living in those motels. And, of families. And they didn't evacuate. That was another issue. They didn't evacuate. They don't have cars. Right. So they were stuck there, and apparently there was a pretty big expense to get them out after that. Right. Well, and, you know, that's kind of the point, is if for whatever reason that that these these folks... Were, were in that housing with no, I mean, really no opportunities in, in good times, right? Then this disaster hits, and they're severely impacted because they can't, you know, evacuate. They can't recover. The The housing that they had is now gone, and it's it's just like there's this whole lost population of people through through no fault of their own. Right, and the reality is, it's, it's it's that group, but it's also you know these you know David's neighbors, so they, they can't move yeah. back there. Ninety year old man and across the street. Ninety year old man, ninety seven. No, the guy across the street. The dad was upstairs. He was ninety seven, and the son was downstairs. He was sixty. They don't have a place to live anymore. They don't have a community. They don't have anything. Um, you know, and it and it's interesting. It's not just them. We were talking to. But what's that? Your nephew. Zachary. We're talking to Rob's nephew. And, you know, all the, I want to say young people, all the younger people, you know, in Tom's River, in that area, their community was hanging out at the boardwalk. And all the boardwalks are gone. Right. You think about it, you know, when you were a teenager, or when you were, you know, 18, 19, 20, and you had the place you hung out, they hung out at the boardwalk. The boardwalks are all gone. So they lost this, and, and they won't go and see. I mean, they even say, we don't really want to see it. We don't want to even think about it. And of course, he did try to see it. Police chased him off, but um, a lot of them just don't really want to see it. It's like they're heartbroken. Right, which is understandable, right? I mean, you, it's same this the same sort of emotions that that uh, Rob experienced and and multiplied, you know, because uh, their it's their youth, it's their home, they're there every day, and suddenly it's been just just gone. Um, it's it's a tragic tragic situation. So I've I've asked a lot of questions and we've jumped around. And as we we wrap, I would love to give you guys the opportunity to speak to. Uh, whatever y you feel compelled to say about your trip or the climate change in general, your experience, um, and just you know, maybe if you know of any way that 
the people watching uh, can, can help, and we are being mirrored on several other channels, and we have our viewership. So just um, you have the have the floor, and just you know let it roll, and let's let's hear what you have to say without me interrupting. Just real quick, I I want to thank uh, OWNN Northern and all the people over there, and they, they're wonderful people. They've been promoting this this interview today. Uh, I work with the uh, Global Revolution. I believe they're picking this up tonight. I want to say hello to everybody on that channel. Um, I, I I wanted to say I. My heart goes out to everybody all up and down the coast, all throughout Jersey, Staten Island, New York City, Long Island. You know, it's... You know, I, I don't mean to be making this interview just about Seaside. I know that everybody is so severely uh, affected by this, and it's not going away. You know, it, this is something that... You know, yes, it's going to... Go, it will take an extreme, extremely long time to recover from it. But as, as we started out this interview tonight, it's three consecutive years. So this isn't going away, and we need to change the way we live. That is the most critical thing that I hope people are starting to take away from this. And it's not just people in the tri-state area or hurricane affected areas you know if, if we're truly compassionate to the people who have been affected by it we need to really consider the way we're living and this especially goes out to the politicians today I was listening to C-SPAN and I was completely shocked and appalled that President Obama is speaking from a diesel engine factory. You know, you know, it, it's it's great that he's working for jobs, but in the light of three consecutive years of natural disasters, he should be he should be walking the walk instead of talking bullshit. Kissing out. You know, why not? Speaking from a wind farm factory, why not a solar panel factory? Uh, this is, it's insane. It's insane that five weeks afterwards, our president is promoting, you know, fossil fuel. You want to say? Yeah, I just want to say a couple things. One is, um, before we went up to New Jersey, I had some conversations on the Occupy Sandy New Jersey organizers site, there was a lot of talk about the fact that there were people in, in Cape May at Wildwood, at Wildwood who were in some really tough shape. And we had really meant to get down there and see what was going on there. Um, apparently the, the, the buildings weren't destroyed, but there was a lot of flooding. And there was also a, a good number of lower income people in that area who were displaced or whose uh, homes were are really destroyed by the water. We didn't get to go down there. If, if, if people have more information, have pictures, video, anything, and they, you know, get it to us, we'll include it in, in the work we're doing. We're certainly going to mention it. That's one thing I want to mention. But the most important thing I wanted to mention, the reason we really did this trip was because Nobody was talking about Sandy anymore, and nobody was talking about the Jersey Shore. It was like people just forgot that anything had happened. Um, and so we just we wanted to be part of the people who weren't forgetting and who maybe could remind people that, you know, that these people are still there and they're still cleaning up and they're still trying to rebuild or, or that people just lost everything and we need to hold them in our hearts and... and no. Uh, a friend of mine who's not a very nice person said, you know, what do these people want? Do they want more money? We're not going to give them more money. This isn't about money. This is about remembering and being kind and empathetic, and, and we can we can all do that. Anyway, that's, 
I said it was a it was a very um it was a very good trip. It was totally overwhelming. It was very emotional. I told people today when I talked about it, it was a hundred times worse than anything I've ever seen, experienced in my life. Um, but I wouldn't have not gone. We had to go. I think we're going to go back. I think we're going to go back. When we go back, we'll stream. Probably. Excellent. Um, well, I I want to thank you, you both, for not only the work you you did up there this weekend, but I. I've um, been fortunate enough to get to know both of you a little bit and read about what you're doing and follow you. Both of you do, you know, extraordinary work along with all the other people in your region, so we're grateful for that. We're especially grateful for you taking the time out after a long, grueling and emotional weekend to share some of the stories with us. Um, I think, honestly, what you were doing is new media at its best and its most effective because it's it's sharing the stories and sharing the images that that we wouldn't see otherwise um, it's too easy to ignore it's too easy to ignore it and so the more that we can put these things out in front of people reasonable people are not going to tolerate it um, so it's it's such important work and I'm so grateful that you you guys did it and, and everything else you do and that you spent the evening with us. I apologize for the technical problems on the front end, but um, I appreciate you hanging in there and, and sticking with us. It was very educational and informative. I, I, I wanted to mention a couple more things. Okay. okay. Uh, I spoke with Vlad on Global Revolution, and he is going to do an edit of our footage. Uh, Elaine and I will be walking working on an edit, like a short documentary. But one thing I, I want to, I have to mention is and on our way home, I want to uh, thank the Russell Lee on Twitter. <laughs> it was absolutely amazing uh, talking about Sue Vasco, the lawyer, I am a lawyer. I am a lawyer. Uh, if anybody needs a laugh, because I needed a laugh on the way home yesterday. So I just have to say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're allowed to say anything you want. The guests have full <laughs> reins on OPN. So, um, well, well, thank you guys for being here, and I, I hope you have a good evening. Thank you so much for all the work. And the, You're welcome. The chatters and the viewers on our channel are expressing their thanks for you sharing your stories and your times. And uh, Northern Guy, I know, had you up on OWNN. And um, it's been been a, a thoughtful and reflective evening. So thank you so much. And um, let's just keep in touch and see what we can do to help the shore recover. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. All right. Have a good night. I'll be talking to you soon. Great. Good night.